International aid for elections is probably the best known part of the democracy assistance field. When people think about democracy aid, they often think about electoral assistance. Elections aid got started in the 1980s when Latin America was making a lot of democratic transitions and the United States and Europe began to engage in trying to support elections in those countries by sending observers and giving other forms of electoral assistance. But it has continued all the way through the last 30 years so that today when almost any country around the world that seems to be making some kind of important transition towards democracy holds elections, observers will be there, international observers, there'll be other forms of international aid. So you can be sure this year in 2015 when Burma has its major national elections, there'll be many international actors engaged in trying to help that process go more smoothly. People often assume that electoral aid being so visible is actually the largest part of democracy assistance. It's not. Elections assistance is usually less than 10% of any one country's, any one donor's support for democracy, human rights, and governance. But it does have the reputation of being very large because of this visibility. The first major area of elections assistance is aid for elections administration. When a country that's poor, has a weak state, maybe coming out of conflict, holds elections for the first time in many years or tries to improve upon previous problematic elections, it faces an enormous array of technical, logistical, and organizational challenges. And there is a body of knowledge and a body of assistance that is often applied in such situations to help them do that. This assistance ranges all the way from what kind of ballot paper will work best given the difficult climate that in which the elections will be held. What kind of ballot boxes will ensure transparency? How can voter education best be carried out? What would be an effective dispute resolution mechanism? There's a whole range of, quote, technical issues, although they're often very political, in fact, uh, issues that go into carrying out a successful election. In addition to assistance directly to electoral management bodies by international actors, Another way in which elections administration sometimes receives international help is by regional organizations that work together to bring heads of electoral management bodies together to share knowledge and experience, and the staffs as well, not just the heads, to bring them together to share experiences. So in Latin America, for example, there's an important association of electoral management bodies that meets and shares experiences. It's been supported from uh, North America and Europe but is a Latin American body, which has been very effective in bringing ideas and experiences together about elections administration. Now, there are a couple of actually pretty difficult issues about election, election administration assistance. One of those is the problem of legitimization of dubious elections. In some cases, the government is really not planning to have a very free and fair election, and they're going to undercut the process in various ways. But they invite in outside actors to support elections administration and say to the world, we had the best experts from North America and Europe helping us with our elections. How can you accuse us of doing wrong? When they, in fact, have other methods, they may be excluding certain candidates from the process. They may be um, you know, putting pressure on different parts of the system in ways that the elections administration assistance can't really affect. So there is a problem and a difficult choice that elections administration providers face in trying to decide whether when they enter a situation are they putting themselves at risk of playing a role of legitimizing a problematic election. Another major issue for elections administration is whether or not such assistance is in some cases in a sense too gold-plated. It's putting into place electoral systems, maybe a very sophisticated computerized registration system in a country that simply can't sustain that investment over time. And in a sense putting into place, you know, a very best possible election system in a country that really needs to have a sort of best fit rather than best practice kind of election. This is again a difficult choice because one wants to help the country do as well as possible, but one has to be realistic about committing the country to certain kinds of practices and systems and investments that it won't be able to sustain when the international community isn't there for the next election or the election after that. Second main area of elections assistance is that of election observing. Of course, this is a very big area with election observers going to most important elections in most regions of the world on a regular basis. Election observing is carried out by a variety of groups, official groups that <coughs> may be associated with parliaments, transnational NGOs, and other kinds of organizations. Election observing has gotten more sophisticated in a couple of ways, I would say particularly over the last 10 to 15 years. 
The first way in which it's improved is that it's gotten less oriented toward sort of quick in and out missions, flying into a country on a Friday, being there for a day of briefings, observing the election on Sunday, and then out the door on Monday and on the way home. This kind of election surfing, which was unfortunately characteristic of some practice of international observing in the early years of the field, has given way to more systematic, longer term election observing in which organizations go to a country in a more sustained way, arriving a year before the election, putting into place long-term observers who carry out analysis and produce reports all along the way, and then building up to election day and staying there for the post-election dispute process as well, which is also an important part of the picture. Election observing has also improved by, I would say, better and, again, more thoughtful use of in partnering with domestic monitors. International actors can support domestic monitors, often student groups or young people who want to organize a domestic monitoring campaign. And these domestic groups have important advantages over international observers. They bring greater local knowledge, sort of greater understanding of the local scene. They're able to produce you know, large numbers of observers compared to the internationals and therefore cover the country much more widely. And in some cases, not all, in some cases they have a greater credibility because they're from the country itself. Election observing presents, like elections administration, also some difficult questions. One of these is the problem, again, of legitimization. In some cases, observers go to a country, see the story on election day, doesn't look too bad, and they give a fairly good report, when in fact the election was undermined and corrupted early on through other means that don't appear on election day. And again, as with offering aid for elections administration, international actors have to make thoughtful and careful choices based on political analysis of whether it makes sense for them to send in international observers into a process that may well be flawed in ways that don't turn up on election day. Another issue that's emerged in the election observing field is the entry of other actors from outside of North America and Europe who are engaging in election observing and unfortunately are doing so for the sake of muddying the waters rather than clarifying the picture about what is occurring with elections. Russia, for example, has been mounting election observing missions in many Central Asian countries or countries in the Caucasus, uh, observers who declare elections to be splendid that clearly aren't. And the proliferation of observing groups is starting to become a phenomenon in other parts of the world as well, like in Africa. Of course, it's good that countries within regions that are politically transitional take responsibility for the observing process and for setting standards, but there is a danger, particularly in the former Soviet Union, but in some other regions of this proliferation of observing groups serving other purposes rather than supporting free and fair elections. I'd say a final problem with election observing, or an issue that, again, one has to attend to, is that imagine an election is held, an international election observing group goes to the election, reports on it, there are problems, the report is critical, what then? If that's the end of the story, and there's a critical report, but in a sense there's no effects, no consequences of that, this undercuts election observing over time. Election observing has to be part of a larger diplomatic policy of engagement and concern about free and fair elections. We can't isolate such a policy and just put it in the hands of observers and say, you take care of that. If the larger diplomatic community is not backing up the work of election observers, then in a sense it can become a hollow exercise. One often hears in different parts of the international policy community or international life generally the accusation that the West equates democracy with elections. It's true that senior Western politicians who are sometimes eager to herald progress in a particular country, political progress, will sort of probably wax a bit too eloquently and lyrically about a positive election that's held and say this country is clearly making big steps towards democracy. That is done at the political level, but the assistance level, the assistance community I think is actually well aware and it's shown in the investments that it tries to make in political change in other parts of the world. It's well aware that elections don't equal democracy. And when you look at the actual spending on democracy assistance, what you see, as I mentioned at the start, is elections assistance is only a small part of a much wider range of programs for accountability and better governance in other ways for civil society development, media development, and so forth. And so the idea that we do elections assistance because we equate <coughs> elections with democracy is, I think, actually a false accusation. 
The other charge that the West is pushing countries towards elections is also, I think, a bit overstated or actually wrong in many cases. It may have been true 15, 20, 25 years ago that there was a bit of over-enthusiasm for elections on the part of the West and an eagerness for every country that seems to be entering into political transition to move to elections. But there have been a lot of sobering experiences since then. And so actually, these days, Western actors are often urging caution, saying to a country in which the dictator has just fallen and the protest movement is eager to move ahead, slow down. Maybe you should wait and build some political consensus. Think about the process of forging a political settlement in a sense before you have elections so that the elections are a product of the political settlement, not necessarily your primary means for trying to forge one. So in Iraq, for example, uh, the coalition forces who were helping run the country after the ouster of Saddam Hussein were not actually pushing Iraqis to have elections. That push came from within the society itself. The push for elections is usually on the part of those people in the society who have driven out uh, a terrible leader and want to move ahead and choose the next leader themselves. And actually, the West is often in the position of saying, think carefully about this, move slowly, we could help. So it isn't that the West has uh, really been the driving force for more elections in the world. That has come from within societies themselves. So in brief, the field of elections assistance is public. It's important. It's been a vital part of the democracy field, but it's not a dominant one. It has two halves, elections administration assistance, which is somewhat more technocratic, although it's laced with political issues, that tries to get at the basic features of how to hold a free and fair election. And then election observing, that tries to bring light and clarity to the process and develop means of reporting on elections and discouraging leaders from undertaking uh, efforts to negate elections. Those are the two main elements. And then, as I mentioned at the end, there are these bigger questions about the overall sort of role of elections in democracy and whether or not the West has gotten it right. Thanks for your attention.